welcome to Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that inspire you to get your story told. Be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com, and while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media network. Now sit back, get ready to take some notes, and let's get started. This episode of Leap Into Your Story podcast is brought to you by Leap Into Your Story course. Visit leapintoyourstory.com where you have a guide to get your story told. I'm Victoria Anderson. Welcome to Leap Into Your Story podcast where you discover your inner story work through the process, and meet others who've done it. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that will inspire you to leap into your own story. Be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com. And while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media network. In this episode, we're going to learn about branding the brand new author. My guest today is Karma Spence. Uh, She is the author of five books, including 57 Secrets for Branding Yourself Online, an award-winning bestseller for public speaking, Superpowers. She helps entrepreneurs and mid-level executives write, publish, and market books based on knowledge between their ears, even if they've never written before and are crazy busy. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Before we dive into your questions and discussion, tell us a little bit about your writing journey and this Frankenstein monster dream where he tells you, if you don't inspire, you will will expire. (laughs) So thank you for, uh, joining us. So please do dive into your journey. Okay. Well, if you do you want the long version or do you want the short version? <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> take, take us down the path. Because <laughs> I guess the, the it, my writer's journey actually probably started when I was about four years old. And I, I even have a photograph of me like first starting my writing when my, there's my dad and he's showing me how to write. And I fell in love with stories and storytelling at this tender age. And I remember one day this, when we were little, when I was little, we moved to East Africa, to Kenya. And I remember we were at Mombasa beach and my dad wrote this word in the sand And he said, karma, what's this word? And I started sounding it out. And I'm like, uh, karma. And from that moment on, I was in love with my name in print. And so I have written stories. It started off with fiction. And I had a dream as a, a child to be the youngest youngest person ever published in science fiction. Well, that didn't happen. (laughs) Obviously, I'm still not published in science fiction. My first short story got published, oh goodness, when I was in my 40s. uh, It was on a website and and it wasn't even a genre piece. It was a what I call a mundane. It was about a girl who goes to a coffee shop and and she goes there because she loves the smell of coffee, but she can't drink it. And she she sees this guy she likes. And then one day he talks to her and then it turns out he has a girlfriend. (laughs) And it's like, I mean, it's really just, it's just a slice of life. And funny side note on that story. I read that story in a Toastmasters uh, meeting and my future husband, the one I'm married to now, was in that meeting and it was because of that short story and some of the adjectives and descriptions I used in it that caught his interest. And so that's part of our love story was that short story. So when I finally, but earlier than that, after the short story was published, but before I met my current 
my current husband, while I was still married to my former husband, <laughs> I published my first book, which was a cookbook. And that was called Bonkers for Bundt Cakes. And I had no idea what I was doing. It's like an eight and a half by 11. And it, I did it in MS Word. And it, it, it really does look like something that someone like printed off on their own computer. And I am working on a second edition. In fact, that was one of the, one of the bad reviews I got on the book was this looks like something that someone else. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I get it. So actually the second version I'm going to do, the first one, one of the, the crit critics I got was that this looks like something you could just get on the back of a pudding box because all of the recipes, which I did on purpose, were recipes that you make from a box of pudding. I did that. I created them myself. I did not copy them from someone else because that's, you know, copyright infringement. I developed them all myself. I just used the model. The second edition will be one page will be all the versions from Lux. The other one will be all from scratch. Same recipes, two different versions. That's going to take me a while because I'm going to have to make all those versions and I'm having a really hard time translating them into from scratch versions because my cakes keep flopping. But I will figure that out. Anyway, <laughs> sidebar. <laughs> I do that a lot. Second book was Your Perfect Pie, which was a way, way better cookbook. And I approached pies from a modular point because most pie cookbooks say, here's your pie. Here's your crust, your filling, your topping. This is the recipe. I did it differently. I said, here are a bunch of crusts. Here are a bunch of fillings. Here are a bunch of tops. You mix and match and make your perfect pie. The book hardly ever sells. Go figure. So I think that one's going to need some tweaking, maybe a new title, a cover, something. I, it's an awesome book. I love that book. I just haven't figured out how to market, how to market it yet. Third book was the first edition of this book, Home Sweet Homepage. And that one I did through Donna Kozik's uh, book in a weekend. And I did that as sort of a big business card to market the business I was in at the time, which was web design. And from that moment, that's when I really started getting the rhythm of how to do a book and do it right. <laughs> By the book after that was 57 Secrets, which I actually did through a boutique publisher because I wanted at least one of my books not to be indie published. I wanted third party end endorsement. Next book was Public Speaking Superpowers, which I did through a hybrid publisher. So it's got a publisher's name on it, but I did all the work. <laughs> That's the way it works. But I learned how to get it into hardcover. So it's got a hardcover edition. It won three awards and was I eventually made it a bestseller. And then this one is also became a bestseller. And because Amazon has a beta program right now, it's also in hardcover. So I got chosen to be a, Amazon thinks I'm an influencer. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> well, that's sort of like my writing journey. And along the way, I've learned every book has taught me something new. Every book has had a different purpose why I've done it. and. It's, it's sort of this growing, changing journey, and it's addictive. <laughs> it's addictive. I keep, I've, I've got probably 20 more books noodling around in my brain, some in various <laughs> states of incompleteness. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> so that's the, that's the author's journey. So that's the first question you asked. <laughs> The second one was about the dream, which I guess yes. you got off my writing website. Yes. I had, I had this dream and in the context of the dream, I was going down the stairs of this old dark castle and Frankenstein's monster was coming up and he asked me, if you inspire, you expire, right? Because he was asking me, basically, if I choke somebody, they'll die. Because in the context of the dream, he wanted to go upstairs and, and, and choke this person who was in my dorm, not my dorm room, but my dorm hall. That was like the context of the dream because this happened when I was in college. 
But when I woke up, I thought, what a cool statement, because it's so true. If you don't inspire, people don't remember you and therefore you expire. And so I took it on as sort of my motto and my tagline, and I've used it ever since because I really do believe that if you don't inspire some sort of reaction, engagement, emotion with your work, with your message, you might as well not even have it. Yeah, that's why I really loved it is because it really struck a chord and part of my new uh, Leap Into Your Story courses, one of the key persuasions is leaving your legacy. Mm, yeah. I mean, not only your, maybe your life story legacy for other relatives. I know with my first book, Touched, I have a lot of family history in it. And family members gobbled that up because they were like, nobody ever said anything. Nobody, this first time we ever heard of that. So that really kind of sparked, um, you know, an interest to maybe get folks writing memoirs. But also too, if you have a unique program, you know, why not write about it, create it and let it keep going long after you are. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No doubt about that. So, well, since we're talking about branding, because it's not just any branding, but branding about new authors. So let's start off with maybe a little definition for those new authors. What exactly is branding? Let's talk about that. Branding. Branding is basically the expectation or the promise that people expect from you. So for example, Stephen King's brand is that I will scare you, but I will scare you in a certain kind of way. Yes. <laughs> you know, and like the Star Wars brand, it it is a space opera with a touch of the spirituality in it. And the, but the Star Trek brand, also science fiction, but different. So there, there's, it goes beyond colors and fonts. There's an emotional quality to brand. So, I mean, it's really hard. It's, sometimes it's hard to kind of describe. And when it comes to an author, your brand promise, it describes what readers can expect from you. What kinds of books will you be writing? If they go to a talk, what, what will they hear you speak about? And that can be tricky sometimes because, I mean, there are some authors who will have a very strong clear brand they only write about this one thing and then there are people there are authors like myself who have like multi-brands so I've got cookbooks and I've got business books and I've got the science fiction stuff going on as well and those are completely different audiences so I there I've got an umbrella brand which is Karma Spence and then I've got the sub brands where the different audiences go so there's different ways you can do your branding. And we were talking about this a little bit before when we were talking about how to do this podcast together. That's why you need to do this as a new author. You need to think about strategically, where do you want to take your brand? Do you want to take it in one direction and be very focused so that you can, whenever an idea pops up into your head, you can say, does this match my brand promise? No, it doesn't. I'm not going to do it. Or yes, it does. I will. Or do you want to have a multi-brand and then fit your ideas into the different brands? Does that make sense? It does. I'm right in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen the diagram with the Victoria Anderson and all the little 
if, uh, what do you call them? The lines going down to all the, each one of the different brands. Yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about now why an inspiring new author should think about their brand even before they're published. But should that even go further, maybe even before they start writing? Yes and no. I think I think there's a discovery process that goes into writing, especially because as you're writing, sometimes you discover yourself and often you'll be writing a book and then you'll go, oh, this is crap. And you'll put it aside and it'll never, see, especially if you're in fiction, mm -hmm. you have no idea how many books are in my filing cabinet that will never, ever see the light of day unless someone's going to write my biography and just say this book <laughs> was going to happen and never will <laughs> it's like the michelangelo half carved sculptures that they have in florence exactly I mean, there's a whole museum of he didn't quite like what he was doing <laughs> exactly and i and authors have lots of that stuff yes <laughs> and sometimes going through that process is fine and you don't you don't necessarily want to lock yourself in that said branding can be an iterative process because when you go through like right now and i'm working i have art like a few months ago i started working on a branding for authors program and i've already started taking people like beta testers through it to to, to fine tune it and i'm getting really good feedback on it because you create this brand and you live with it for like maybe two, one, two, three years and see how it feels. And then you go through the process again to see, okay, do I want to do more of this? Do I want to branch out? And so branding is, I mean, look at Pepsi. If you look at the history of Pepsi, there's like all the, and look at Coke. I mean, Coke has changed. It's still been Coke. They've still been Pepsi, but their look and feel has changed. What they offer has changed. New Coke, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Authors can do that too. Yeah. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you just kind of, it's, it's a branding is not something that's written in stone, but it's a good idea to get a feel for what do you want to focus on now? get that promise on a piece of paper put it next to your computer and focus on it for one to two years so that you can get really good at that and then branch out it's like when i was first learning business someone said it's okay to have multiple businesses but what you want to do is get one business up like you're spinning that plate on a on a stick get that one going set it down once that's spinning on its own then start the next business spinning on a stick don't try to do both of them at the same time because then you're just going to get broken plates on the floor same thing with multiple branding and don't do what i did because i've been doing all of them at the same time and it's crazy making <laughs> it's crazy making and that's part of re part of the reason why i'm developing this author branding program because i don't want the authors that I've been, I mean, I've been doing this podcast with authors and I've been working with authors and I'm seeing them making the mistakes I've made. And I've been seeing them struggling with branding. I'm like, okay, I can help relieve this pain. I just need to get the program done. And so that's what I'm doing. And I'm, and it's working, it's working and it's awesome. And it's beautiful. And it's like, all you need to do is get these like three statements down and it clarifies you so that you now know I've got 10 ideas for a story or a book. Which one do I choose next? You match them up to your statements and it becomes extremely clear which one's the right one to work on next. That's what branding does to you. It clarifies you. It gets rid of, it helps you prune so that your roses, your, your book roses, can flourish. Yes, I think clarity is a big part of this struggle. Um, 
not just in business, but in writing, but and life. Yeah. Um, when you when you don't have the clarity, um, I know with me when I've done coaching, part of it, I'm not just a writing coach. I'm kind of writing slash life coach. <laughs> so yeah. They yeah. kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Yeah, um, there, there's a Devo song where the, the lyrics are, freedom of choice is what you've got. Freedom from choice is what you want. Yes. And it's, <laughs> and it's kind of true because freedom of choice, too many. I mean, look how many yes. cable channels we've got. My husband and I end up just usually watching one or two channels all the time. Right. <laughs> it's like, that's it. Yes. And there is, there is such, there is too much information and, uh, you know, different uh, strokes for different folks. And you have to find out which one of them strokes works for you. Exactly. And you need that clarity. You know, you have a thousand different programs, which one is going to work for you? Exactly. And I think with new authors, they often struggle with idea overload. Yes. So if they do the, that branding work early, they can at least take all those ideas and put most of them into a box to work on later and focus on the ones that really make their heart sing now. Right. And then they can go back to the box later and later they may decide, you know, some of these ideas will never make my heart sing exactly. and they can chuck them. Right. Yeah, that's, that's my rule of thumb. What excites me in the morning? That's where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. And I, a lot of times is you, there's some things that are fleeting, fleeting fires and other exactly. ones are just burning passions that keep on. Um, you don't need a whole lot to keep stroking them. They're in yeah. fires. They just keep on going. And you just have to learn how to fan them every day. <laughs> exactly. They don't go out. So they don't go out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's talk about, I know we've talked about um, some of the things that we should, but let's maybe dive into what are some of the costs um, of not maybe being proactive with branding? Well, one of the obvious ones is, the lack of clarity. Right. Another is that you end up you end up being like me, <laughs> and just you you end up you end up going for the wrong bright shiny objects. I think if I had truly done some of this deep branding work early on in my business. I may have come up with a different game plan. And some of the books I wrote might not have gotten written or different versions of them would have gotten written. And perhaps I would be in a different place in my career at this point because I would have been more strategic. Another cost is it cuts down on your confidence when you keep changing lanes because you start, you, you go down one alley and then you go, that's not working. And then you go down another and that's not working. And you start feeling like I suck <laughs> and I'm a failure and I can't do anything right. And if there's anyone in your life who feeds that particular flame, which when I was, my former husband was one of those people makes it worse and then you just you get into this cycle where you start attracting more people who feed that flame and you end up being in a very dark and lonely place where your message the message that you were meant to get out into the world is in danger of going out and mine was i mean i the boyfriend i had before my husband attacked me and actually ended up in prison because of it and I realized at that point that if I continued on the path that I was on, the next one would kill me. So I like took time off from guys and got my head on straight, which is why I attract this amazing husband. And because of his support and love, I've been able to continue that work 
and my writing is flourishing. I'm starting to get back into my fiction because my former husband told me to stop fiction because it didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on that little, that is still a mind gremlin that mind goblin that's eating at me, but I'm starting to do little fiction. If you go to my radio blog, you'll start seeing little, I, everything I write goes to science fiction, no matter what <laughs> innocuous uh, writing prompt and it, I'll turn it into an alien. <laughs> hands down it, it will be an alien <laughs> alien invasions are everywhere <laughs> but it's like i'm starting to Not get that there's back. anything wrong with that <laughs> alien invasions <laughs> but it's like i'm starting to get me back the me that was in my you know 30 years ago me and it, it and if you if i had done this work earlier that me I am today would have, been, would have happened 20 years ago instead of now. And I don't want that to happen to other people. Don't let your voice get silenced. Silenced. Yes, yes. I agree. And that's one of my passions is I, you know, there's always been a connection. I know we met on like a virtual uh, summit, like almost a year ago. And there is something about you. I think you and you and I kind of connect, even though my audio wasn't working. <laughs> Nothing. I had to type all my communications on my little <laughs> Zoom breakout meeting. Um, but I was like, yeah, I, I like karma. There's something about her. And now I now I see why is you and I have similar um, passions and you know, one of my regrets uh, is not doing this sooner, yeah. sooner, because again, um, I mean, I've always been writing for 20 some years, but not taking it seriously enough yeah. um, and listening to all the noise. I mean, I, I did have other things that were wonderful. And I, I was writing all through those and some of the not so wonderful times. As you read my memoir series, I don't write a memoir. I write the series. <laughs> right. So, uh, but yeah, it was a lot of, it's the writing that had been the consistency throughout all the good times and the not so good times. And yeah. You, you talk to authors who've got like 20 books under their belt and you're like, I yes. only have five. And yeah. then there's authors like you have five. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I, like he says, I, I'm all over the place as far as my writing and, and I'm going to probably do some other books on life coaching too. So, yep. The brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of mindset books I want to work on, and I'm probably going to do some on like marketing and writer's block. I've got a writer's block when I want to write. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so we share, it's been revealed, is we, <laughs> we share this deeper passion is to try to stop others, um, you know, or at least minimize, I don't know if you can stop them, but at least yeah. minimize and get them to, a, it's like you says about what's the cost of doing it. It's the confidence factor. Yeah. And the more you erode your confidence, the worse it gets. Yeah. So you can get there quicker with somebody kind of handholding you, the better you could do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So absolutely kudos to you, Miss Karma. And I'm so glad that we've had this opportunity to finally hook up and yep. um, meet and, you know, face to face with working audio and visual. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And share our gifts and our absolutely. passion with other aspiring uh, writers, even seasoned ones go through rough times where they start questioning is this still working for me so absolutely I, it's fact, not even even about new ones it's just about authors and maintaining the mindset the confidence and the support and maintaining the clarity to keep on going absolutely in fact they've 
imposter syndrome is more common in intelligent, successful people than anyone else. So if yes. you've got imposter syndrome, that means you're really smart yes. <laughs> and awesome. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a few people that it says, you know, well, um, you know, what if, what if I'm not as good as other people? And I go, I got news for you. There's always going to be somebody better. <laughs> yeah. End of story. End of story. And there's going to be people who are not as good. There you, know? you go. But I says, you know, I've always, and here's the funny thing, even if you don't like somebody, I've actually learned more from people I considered my enemies because there's always something to learn. Um, you know, even writing, author, I mean, I learned this in just business and watching some of the not so honest business people, but, you know, they're not all shysters. Some of right. the things they do better, and that's, you know, if, they, if you think that there's somebody out there who's a con person, even look at that because there's something, there is some magic sauce, even if they are a con person, there's yeah. always some magic sauce that they have figured out that you right. can learn from. Right. I mean, that's what, that was like my big aha moment in all my books is, you know, I, I had to reflect and go, you know, my support system was pretty good, but people I didn't like were even better. <laughs> they taught me way more. Um, yeah. So everything's a lesson. Everything's yeah. a lesson and a step. Everyone's a teacher. Everyone's a teacher. Mm -hmm. So, but for those who are imposters, stop it. You're not, <laughs> who think they're imposters, stop it. Um, you have something, even if somebody's doing it better, there's, there's always not doing it the way you do way. it. That's right. There's always a different way. And you may not um, appeal to 99 people, but that one person's going to love you to death because you were just what they were looking for. Exactly. That's how I feel about it. Exactly. Yep. Well, let's talk about, um, we talked about branding early on and, and trying that out. So is, would that be a concern? I mean, have you run across this for people who think that they might be pigeonholed or um, what if they want to change it? You said maybe two to three years, they should at least stay in them. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I think... It, I think it depends on the author. I mean, some authors I think are better served by sticking to one route. I was talking to, uh, it was an, an episode early in August. The author had ideas in like three different genres and he made the conscious choice. I'm going to do this genre now because this one is going to, get me the most traction now and he's going to focus on it for a few years because he wants to make a name for himself and, and then maybe later he'll branch out but right now this is what he's going to focus on and he made that conscious choice and it's a very 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 niche audience it in fact it's the kind of books i wouldn't read <laughs> it's very interesting but it's not it's everyone has their cup of tea, that's fine. But sometimes you need to do that. You need to get really, really good at a micro niche because you learn a lot. It's like some people will say, oh, well, I want to be a science fiction writer, so I will only read science fiction. That's a very bad thing to do because then you become a crappy science fiction writer. You want to read broadly, but write narrowly, narrowly, because how do you bring fresh insight into your genre if you're only reading within the genre? So it's, it's one of these things where you're balancing, you want to get really good at something small. And the only way you can get really good at something small is if you focus on just that. If you're doing three things at once, 
you're going to be a Jack or Jane of many trades and a master of none. And two to three years may sound like a really long time, but it's not. It was spy. It was spy. I mean, public speaking superpowers came out in 2018, and we're talking right now in 2021. And I'm like, how did that happen? I'm working on the audio book. And are, is anyone going to care by the time I get that audio book <laughs> out, you know? Because <laughs> it's just the time is just whisking by. So two to three years is not that long, but it's long enough if you focus on one thing for you to get really good at that and then branch out. So no, you're not going to get pigeonholed if you are conscientious about not getting pigeonholed. Good to know. You make those choices. Yeah. You make those choices. But I think just the most important of anything is just be do things consciously. Absolutely. That's that's the thing. Do things consciously. Yeah. Which yeah. is why the branding is good because then you're making conscious choices. Right. You're being aware and you're being conscious about it. Because if you just do what I did, which is like, oh, that sounds good now. That sounds <laughs> you end up with a mess. <laughs> and that's what I'm having to do. I'm having to clean up all these websites that have like multi brands and multi content. I'm like, I don't know. how It's going to take me years just to clean up everything and get the brands to be clean. But if I had started out consciously, that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> you know, uh, hindsight's always 2020. <laughs> yes, it is. So I, I am being one of those teachers that says, do as I say, and not as I did. Not as I do, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't fall into the pit hole I did. That's right. That's right. Yeah, sometimes it is overwhelming. I know. I, well, we won't go into all my multi-craziness um, of things going on at once. So <laughs> at all. Yeah. But the struggle is real and I know it well. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's talk about, as we wrap up here, the three most important branding decisions to make as a new author. Three most important branding decisions. One, what do you stand for? And what I mean by that is, so what is your line in the sand? And this is a branding decision of, is your brand going to be the kind of brand that will have raunchiness in it? You know, so there are, there are writers who, you know, they start off with a clean book and then it eventually gets more and more raunchy because the audience is growing and that's a perfectly okay way to go and there are brands where everything is clean period of innocence and that's what the way they choose to do it and you will never see a cuss word in their book ever and that is that what you stand for or is your brand always going to be funny is it, it there are things it's what is the emotional resonance that you stand for in your brand so for example in my brand it doesn't matter whether it's a cookbook or a business book the through line in all my brands is that I want to unleash your creativity period, end of sense. I am all about unleashing the potential that is inside you, period. Whether it's your kitchen creativity or your writing creativity or your ability to travel and see science fiction everywhere you go, it's all about unleashing your potential to enjoy your life your way. That's the through line. That's what I stand for. And I express it in like, these wildly different ways, but that's, that, that's, the, that's the through line. So you need to decide what's your through line, what's that. 
And that ties into your values. So when I walk an author through this branding program, we start off with a values exercise and you can do the values. It's free on my website. You go to karmaspence.com, just like go, go into the little search bar and go like values exercise. There's a values exercise, go through that values exercise and you come up with your, like your five top values. That's the very first thing you do because everything branches from there. You need to understand what your values are, what you stand for, what's important to you and your business because your mission statement branches from that. Your vision statement branches from that. Your brand promise branches from that. And once you know what those values are, every other decision becomes easier because now you, someone can email you and say, I want to partner with you on this. You take it and you're like, does it match my values? Yes. Then you can consider it. No, it's an easy no. You just write them back and say, no, thank you. And that's another reason why you want to also have the mission and vision makes those no's even better. So for example, I got an email the other day that said, I love your I love Karma Spence and I want to partner with you because we have all these wonderful animal products. And I'm like, I, I have a pet. I love pets. I don't talk about pets and I don't have a pet related audience. Partnership makes no sense. <laughs> Easy no. <laughs> but you know, if I, if I was like in an, if I was unclear what my brand was, I might go, why not? <laughs> you know? So that's why values, mission, vision, brand promise is like the, the, the core of an author brand. And did I answer your question? I think I went for a tangent. <laughs> no, you answered three things. It, it was very three well. Things. Okay. <laughs> and then some. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, why don't you, go, I know you mentioned the value um, evaluation on your website. So tell the listeners where they can find more of Karma Spence books, programs, other goodies that you have to offer. So what? go ahead you know, with your website and your links. All right. Well, the, the two places I recommend are authoneering.com. That is the website you want to go to if you want to learn more about how I help you write and publish a book. And if you are suffering from writer's block, there is a writer's block assessment there that is free. So whenever you are suffering from writer's block, you take the assessment and it diagnoses what's causing your writer's block so that you can find the right cure because writer's block can be caused by up to six different causes. And if you're using the wrong cure, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> the other one is bookmarketingclub.com. And on that site, there's a, a link where you can get two different free freebies. One is your basic book marketing essentials. And I forget what the other one's called, <laughs> but there's a page with both of them on there. But that's where you go for all the information I have about book marketing. All right. Very good. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your amazing insights today. I know this has been very helpful to me, and I know there's other authors out there that can find some really great value with uh, our podcast episode. And I want to thank you for tuning into Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, work through the process, and meet others who've done it so you can be guided to writing your story. Thank you for tuning into the Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. Remember to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're there, subscribe and like to us via your favorite social media network. We're looking forward to seeing you next time on the Leap Into Your Story podcast.